That was for Gloria. That was not for me. Good morning. Welcome to Bay Presbyterian Church and our worship of the living God. It's so good to have you here today. And as we've already pointed out, it's good to have Gloria Gully here today. And we appreciate Gloria being here for us. A few announcements as we get started. First of all, Pastor Patrick is... Uh, north with friends and, uh, and family, and uh, so uh, we're looking forward to your soon return. And um, second of all, let's see, what else we got? Oh, the ladies' luncheon. Um, this Wednesday at noon, Rachel, where are you? There you are. There you are, okay. Rachel, you have anything you want to say about that? That's a, a ladies' event, so I don't want any men signing up for that, please. <laughs> um, let's see, the Gideons were here last week, and as a follow-up to that, you'll have an insert in your bulletin if you wanted to make a, a donation to them. Um, appreciate that. Next Sunday morning, we're going to do Choose Your Own Hymn, so I'm, I'm suggesting that if you have a favorite, let's uh, put it right down on a scrap of paper and be ready next week to jump up and get your favorite hymn accounted for. Uh, in your bulletin, you'll find some assorted Bible studies. Feel free to participate in that on Thursday night. Um, Pastor Patrick is going to begin a series on Abraham. Uh, and so if, uh, if you'd like to join us, then we'd love to have you at 6.30 on Thursday evening. Um, next week, we'd like to collect some brown bags from you. Um, this is Brown Bag Sunday, and um, we're going to we're going to have a collection. This is there is stapled to the side of each of those bags. Chuck will be out in the front uh, patio uh, to hand out bags if you're interested in helping out. They need beans. They're asking for beans, black beans, red beans, navy beans, baked beans. Uh, I'm all out of beans. But uh, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for a lot of beans, rice and beans. But there's a sheet stapled on the, on the bags that'll tell you that exactly that. And if you could, uh, during the week, if, if you care to participate in that, you can uh, go shopping this week and pick up some beans, put it in that brown bag and bring it back next Sunday. And then we'll send it over to the Cafe of Life. Uh, that would be a big help in the past. I think our record is we got 77 bags back uh, one time, and they, they weighed it. And it was like a ton and a half of food that we passed on to them. So that's a lot. That's a lot of food. Maybe we can beat a ton and a half. I'd like that. Beans are heavy, so that's good. <laughs> Finally, um, we are... Um, both happy and sad uh, that the Rogers are moving to California. Um, we are we are sad for us. We are happy for them because they're going to move closer to grandchildren, and you know how that works. Uh, but I would like for Tom to come here. We, Tom has been instrumental in in our in our church, and particularly in the finances. And, and we, we've got a little something for Tom. And um, we, we've got this little thing that he could put on his desk or um, with gratitude for your unwavering dedication and commitment, which has contributed towards our success. Thank you for your work, Bay Presbyterian Church. <laughs>
But Tom, Tom, is, uh, Tom has been the definition of steady for us. And uh, he has been there day in and day out. And uh, my favorite story is, and I've probably told you this before, but when Hurricane Irma came in, um, it was, the next day was payroll. And Tom was at his desk taking care of payroll. And the whole staff was grateful to him for that. <laughs> but uh, Tom, has, Tom has been always there whenever we've needed him. And he's, um, he's been a great person to help us with our finances and accounting. And, Tom, we're grateful to you and wish you the best in, you. in California. You. And now let's take a few moments to prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning. I invite you to join me in the responsive reading of our call to worship. This can be found in the front cover of your bulletin and likely on the screens. This morning, our call to worship is taken from Philippians 2, 8 through 11. Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Our first hymn this morning, Stand With Me as we sing together, Praise Him, Praise Him.
our great God and Heavenly Father, how we thank you and praise you as the God of all creation. God, we, we are here today to praise your name, to let your, let your excellencies be known one to another here today, God, as we share in common our Lord Jesus Christ. And today, God, we pray that you'd bless our time together, that by your spirit you'd be with us and among us, and in us, so that our worship might be in spirit and in truth. God, our heart's desire is that as we leave this place, we'd be able to say together, today we have been in the presence of the Almighty. Hear us, O God, we make our prayer. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he who lived and died and rose again, and who while on this earth taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. And please be seated. This is the reading of the word of God. Exodus 20, 1 through 21. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers of the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now when all the people saw the thunder, and the flashes of lightning, and the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid, and trembled, and stood far off, and said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear. For God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. 
the people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Now for ushers will come forward, we'll continue our worship of Almighty God as we present to him our tithes and offerings. Would you bow for prayer with me? Our great God and Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the blessings that we enjoy from your hand. God, our confession today is that we have uh, treated those uh, gifts lightly. We have taken them for granted and we've We've sought to uh, appreciate the gifts and not the giver. And God, our prayer at this time is that you would take these gifts, now that you would uh, take them and multiply them and use them to build your church here in Southwest Florida and to the ends of the earth. We make our prayer in the name of Jesus, who in, is indeed our strong Savior. Amen. Stand with me as we sing together, standing on the promises of God.
seated. At this time, I invite you to pull from your bulletin a prayer sheet. Take a glance down there, pick out two or three. We want to remember Lori Rufus. Can continue to pray for Lori. Her family's here now, her kids, and that's been a big encouragement to her. So we want to pray for Lori. Rob Gelfie, that is my neighbor who is um, going to lose a leg, and we want to pray for Rob. Um, heard from Sharon Klopp this week. That was very nice to get a phone call from her. So um, remember these and any requests that you may have. Remember them silently, and I'll conclude us after time. Let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer. great God and Heavenly Father, today, as we pause to think of those around us, we remember not only the Ten Commandments, which we heard a few moments ago, but remember the first and greatest commandment, and the second that is like unto it, that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. And God, we recognize that our neighbor is whoever is in need and within the purview of our eyesight or earshot. And so, God, we would we'd want to pray for these requests before us because people have asked us to make our prayers for these people. And so, respectfully, God, we are in your presence to petition you on behalf of these people who are ill. And uh, God, we pray that you come alongside and grant strength according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And uh, we pray that you, as the great physician, would rest your healing hand on these people. Um, God, we want to uh, pray for our, our nation's military and for all of those people who have made great sacrifices and who have left family in order to serve their country and to protect us. And so, God, we thank you for them and pray your safety upon them and that you would be present in their hearts and their minds as they uh, serve us and their country. God, we thank you for the ministries that we can be involved in and think particularly of the Cafe of Life now as uh, we are, are helping out and pray that uh, our, our harvest will be plentiful for them and that, that you would use these gifts that we will make, God, you would use that to enhance the ministry of the Cafe of Life to those needy people. And God, we, we pray for the Gideons, thanking you for the privilege of, um, of being able to, to purchase Bibles and have them distribute them for us. We thank you for that and pray that that too would be a, a great harvest of, of souls for your kingdom, God. And that's what our heart is. And so we pray, God, that you would use the gifts that, uh, that we give out of the abundance that you've given us so that uh, we might be able to serve our neighbor, loving them as we love ourselves. God, we pray for our pastor now as he comes to us to preach your word. We pray that you would fill him with your spirit and that you would fall on us by your spirit so that uh, the, the word he preaches would find fertile soil and that you would bring a great harvest in our own souls. And God, we pray this because of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. If you'd open up your Bibles to Luke, the 18th chapter of Luke is what we'll be looking at today. 
It is good to be back here among you. Gene and I were up in Rochester, Minnesota, and when we got up there last Wednesday, it was 10 degrees warmer there than here. <laughs> Two days later, we had four inches of snow. <laughs> the extremes are just amazing to me. Well, this morning, I want to preach from this very well-known passage of Scripture and hopefully add a new insight or two to its meaning for us. So we'll read Luke 18. Notably, this passage appears in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, an indication of its importance for us. So which Gospel should we pick from? Luke, of course, because Luke was a physician and therefore has an eye for detail. <laughs> You'll notice that the meditation in your bulletin is from David Livingston. He was a Scottish physician. He and I are both in the Royal College of Physicians, his in Edinburgh, mine in London. All right, we'll read Luke 18, starting with verse 18. And the ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All of these I have kept since my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? He said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, see, we left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. This is the very word of God given to you and by his grace preached to you. Let's start with prayer. Almighty God, we acknowledge that it is only in you that true wealth is found. Only in you that security is found. And only in you that eternity can be found. Open now our hearts and minds to see clearly and think clearly about the place of money and of you in our lives. For it's in the strength of Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. In 2020, a man I doubt any of you have ever heard of, a man by the name of Chuck Feeney, completed his goal of giving away his nine billion dollar fortune. He was the man who started the airport duty-free shops. He kept two million for himself and his wife, thus giving in total 375,000 percent more than his current wealth. No one else has ever done that. Could you? This passage that we just read has bothered me for decades. Actually, it's greatly bothered me and stressed me. All kinds of concerning questions arise. Am I supposed to sell everything and give it to the poor? Am I keeping all of the commandments from my youth? That one's easy. Could I force a camel through the eye of a needle? If not, how can I be saved? What does all this mean in a society like ours, which is obsessed with money and profit at virtually any cost? 
most disturbing of all, that the answers to these questions lead us to walking away very sad, as this rich young ruler did. So we're going to dissect our way through this passage to be sure that we understand. This, after all, is the very word of God given to us that we might understand him and what he expects from us. In the end, I think you're going to be surprised. Very, very surprised. I hope. But that's the nature of God's right-side-up teaching in our upside-down thinking and culture. The fact that we're surprised reveals much about our true understanding of who God really is. So we start with verse 18. And a ruler asked him, now who is this ruler? And now you're saying, this isn't going to be 30 minutes, is it? (laughs) We only know that he's young. And that he is, as Luke records it in verse 23, extremely rich. Matthew and Mark both record that he had great possessions. So the storyline is a setup. And it involves a ruler, someone who has both power and great possessions. Perhaps a ruling council member like Nicodemus was. But we don't know. What we do know is that he had the very things that men most crave and often sacrifice their lives and their families for. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answers him somewhat surprisingly. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Here is the critical question revealed from the very beginning. What must I do? do? You shouldn't scoff at this. It's a question, I think, deeply buried in all of our hearts and our minds. What must I do, or what good thing must I do to merit heaven? So all of the people who attended Sunday school are tuned right in now, and that's a blatant advertisement for coming at 9 a.m. to adult education. In my medical practice, I've taken care of many extremely wealthy people, people who are on social media, TV, you would know them right away. Their great wealth leads them to believe they can simply do something or buy whatever it takes to achieve their ends. They believe, in fact, that with enough money, they can even live forever. And some of them have made provisions to have their bodies frozen and their DNA frozen so that they can be resurrected, I guess. But if we change this young ruler's question slightly in the likely manner in which he really meant it, it would be more akin to this. What can I do or what will it cost me to buy eternal life? This immediately reveals this man's heart and his understanding. He thinks he can earn salvation by his works, or perhaps even by it. He believes that either by works or by money, he merits salvation. As if he could do something such that God is now obligated to give him eternal life. He's earned it. You see the problem right away. He assumes that by his works, by his actions or his money, he can get what he wants. And being a ruler and a rich man, he does what all powerful rich people do. He goes to the most powerfully placed person he can find to get what he wants. Jesus. He has enough respect to call him good teacher. And Mark records that he actually ran up and knelt before Jesus to ask his question. So why does Jesus answer the way he did? Is this an attempt by the rich young ruler at flattery? He doesn't call him rabbi or lord. He calls him good teacher. In the Greek, Jesus answers the man with a question. And in the original Greek, it would have this emphasis. Why do you call me good? 
only God is good, Jesus answers with a redirection, a move away from what this man should do to what is good and what his heart should actually seek after. Surprising to those who were listening is that what God, Jesus is saying here isn't that he isn't just a good teacher. Rather, he is God. By saying only God is good, he is telling this rich man that he, Jesus, is God himself. Recognize what this is. This is a theophany. The point is that doing to be thought good and meritorious is a foolish thing and a fool's errand. Jesus instead points him by his answer, not to what he can do, but to himself, the one who is good and to whom our attentions and our desires should be focused. Jesus answers the man's question in verse 20 and tells him, if you want to be saved, keep all the commandments. And again, for us who know the full story, this is shocking. Is Jesus really saying that salvation can come by keeping all the commandments? Sunday school attendees? The answer is yes. That's exactly what he's saying. Notice the emphasis, though, to this man. Because this rich ruler believes, as revealed in his opening question to Jesus, that he can earn eternal life by his deeds, by his keeping of the commandments. By the answer to that question, what must I do? He believes he's good enough and actually merits reward. And remarkably, again, revealing who this ruler really is, he responds that he's kept all of the commandments, and perfectly so. Gene and I, in our street evangelism, have met one and only one person who has said this to us, and it, it kind of took us aback. I don't sin. I've kept everything perfectly so. In fact, he says since his youth in verse 21. By now, if I had been there, I'd be inching away from this guy, thinking a thunderbolt or an earthquake or something as bad is about to happen. As when Rachel read, in Exodus 20, when the Ten Commandments were given. And indeed, something very bad is about to happen. How does Galatians 3, 10 to 13, answer his question? Paul writes, For all who rely upon the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident, Paul goes on to say, that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone hanged on a tree. The point is that one could theoretically be saved by keeping the law, but only if perfectly kept, which isn't possible, as was pointed out this morning and we discussed, because of our original sin. So in fact, it is not possible for any of us to be saved by keeping all of the commandments in some idea that we would have that would be perfect except for Christ, who did keep the law perfectly and hence could be the perfect lamb without blemish or spot. And that is why the law is a curse, because man cannot keep it. Strive as hard as you want, and you cannot keep it. In fact, I think the young ruler hangs himself by his own testimony here, his own false witness telling Jesus, in his opinion, he's indeed perfectly kept the commandments, which, of course, is a lie, an evidence of extreme self-righteousness. 
In fact, isn't it remarkable how the human mind can build what seems like a perfectly airtight case to protect ourselves and fool ourselves? J.C. Ryle, in response to this ruler's answer, wrote this, an answer more full of, full, full of darkness and self-ignorance is impossible to conceive. He who made it could have known nothing rightly, either about himself or God or God's law. I think he said it right. Nonetheless, Jesus kind of gives him a pass on that and moves on and strikes at the very heart of the matter by revealing the truth about this man's heart. Verse 22, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. Notice the word that Jesus chose, treasure stored in heaven. We're going to come back to that word. Now, had this been a scene in a movie, I think the, the whole set would have fallen silent and the act actors shocked because in 27 words, Jesus puts his finger on the heart of the two issues happening in this encounter. And from this, the listener falls silent with new understanding about what happened. It reminded me, as I read and studied this, of Edgar Allan Poe's words. He said this, words have no power to impress the mind without the exquisite horror of their reality. And Jesus has indeed just made plain both the exquisite horror and the futility of trying to merit salvation by doing, by a keeping of the law, and has now made clear their reality. In fact, ironically enough, as I mentioned before, the rich ruler's response that he had kept all the commandments is a lie, a false witness, and in and of itself, a violation of the ninth commandment that Rachel read earlier. He likely also violated the Eighth Commandment to not steal and its corresponding positive side of being generous, else he likely would not have been extremely rich with great possessions. And so Jesus, knowing where this man's heart really is, gives him the remedy to his sin sickness, a sickness that's going to land him in everlasting perdition. Jesus tells him, you lack one thing, one single barrier that if you overcome it, you will gain eternal life. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. Notice the sequence here. Sell it all, give it to the poor, in other words, people unlike yourself, and follow me. Jesus brilliantly answers the young ruler's question by holding up a mirror such that this wealthy man of great possessions can now see himself with clarity and answer the question for himself. Is Jesus what he really wants or is it his great wealth and possessions that he wants? The truth comes screaming in at this point. Verse 23 for Luke records this, but when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Now recall verse 22, that Jesus spiced the deal here, telling the ruler if he did this, it wasn't like he was simply going to go from rich to poor. No, Jesus tells him plainly that if he does this, he'll have even greater treasure than what he owns now in heaven, and for all eternity. But it means being rich in Christ's way, not the culture's way. And with, I imagine, begrudging clarity, the rich young ruler walked away very sad. Philip Riken, in his commentary on this passage, notes something interesting. Rather than telling the rich ruler to do something, Jesus tells him to get rid of something. 
It would be an act, he said, of subtracting all the things that were standing in the way of his entrance to the kingdom of heaven. Does Christ's lesson here dawn on us? Are we ridding ourselves of those things that stand in the way of our gaining true treasure in heaven, of giving our lives to Christ and to following him? You see, and this is where I think this passage most often gets misunderstood. It isn't the money per se that's the problem here. Rather, it's the place and meaning attached to money that's the problem. The issue is not one of wealth and riches, but of trusting in those over Jesus. So is the lesson that we should sell everything we have and give it to the poor so that we can get to heaven? Is that the message? No, no, and no. That is not the message. Without a call from Christ to do that in your life, that would simply be doing. It would be a futile works-based type of trying to earn salvation. If I do this great thing, surely Christ would see my merit and I will be ushered through heaven's gates. And that kind of thinking is why I called this message the foolishness of anything but God. But works and wealth is not what is being taught here. And I hasten to add, there are individuals, many of them, who are called to this, as hard as it would be to even imagine. Heirs and heiresses who have turned away from fabulous wealth and turned to Christ, to the mission field like David Livingston, or to using the money to bind up the injured, to feed the poor, and to care for the widow and the orphan. Look at Zacchaeus in Luke 19, 1 through 10. He gave up fabulous wealth to follow Jesus. But the lesson is this. Whatever stands between you and Christ is an idol. And it's to be destroyed, eliminated, discarded. If there's something between you and the command, follow me, we must pray earnestly for the faith to put it in its proper place such that we really could follow our Lord. For the truth is that absolute faith in Christ requires that we do give up many things this upside-down culture reveres. Matthew 6, 19 through 21 and verse 24 makes this very clear. Notice the word I, re I asked you to remember. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves cannot break in and steal. And now of verse 21, which makes the matter crystal clear. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Bingo. This is the critical key that opens up our understanding of this passage. He elaborates further, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. I'm still in Matthew. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You simply cannot serve God and money. There it is. Worshiping wealth means you cannot worship God in the way he must be worshipped. You've made money and possessions your God, and your heart is not with God, but with the security of possessions. But what if you were given this command by Jesus to sell everything and give it to the poor? Would you, so to speak, pass the test? The answer takes us to the heart of this teaching narrative. And I believe it's this. We are to meditate and pray very, very deeply about this question. Who and what 
is the ultimate ruler, the ultimate security, the ultimate authority in my life? To what do I attach the most importance in my life? Where does my heart really lie? It's like being that monkey who reaches through the trap door to grab the banana inside the cage, but the door is too small to get his hand and the banana out. But he refuses to let go of the banana. Money is like that banana for us. So we stubbornly cling to false notions about the security of money, of our possessions. An interesting thing to me, and now I'm doing it, is we notice people move to Florida. They don't have basements. Their garages are so full of stuff, they can't park their cars. And when I go into my neighbor, who I've gotten to know, I said, when's the last time you touched this stuff? I don't know. A decade? But I feel good knowing my possessions are here. But, is, but your car is being ruined. <laughs> Bananas. What is it going to be? Let our grip on the banana go? Or the good life that Christ promises? Treasure on earth or treasure in heaven? The Bible, by the way, has much to say about wealth and its place in our lives. Proverbs 18.10 has this to say about the false security of wealth. The name of the Lord, you know this verse, is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it an unscalable wall. For those who place Christ first, the words of Psalm 18.2 ring in our ears. The, rock, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. He's my shield and the horn of my salvation. He's my stronghold. For those who reject Christ as foremost in their lives, the words of Zechariah 9.3 will be true as it was for Tyre. Tyre has built herself a rampart and heaped up silver like dust and fine gold like mud of the streets. But behold, the Lord will strip her of her possessions and strike down her power, and she shall be devoured by fire. There's the contrast. Which is it going to be for us? As I've mentioned, many have misinterpreted this passage. Is it a requirement to sell everything, to do a good work in order to gain salvation? Again, to be clear, no. Let me relieve you of that. It took decades for me to relieve myself of that. It took seminary <laughs> for me to relieve myself of that. That is not what is being universally taught here. What is clear from this passage is that anything that stands in the way between us and Christ is what we need to get rid of. Whether it be job title, great possessions, whatever it would be. The true requirement for salvation has nothing to do with works. It has nothing to do with merit. It doesn't even consist in doing and hoping that it will be seen as merit warranting salvation. The true requirement is putting absolute, total, complete trust, faith in Jesus and letting go of our precious little bananas. Next time I preach this, I'm going to bring a banana as a prop. <laughs> so why so much emphasis on money in Scripture? This, this really bothered me. I grew up very, very poor, and as a physician... We weren't rich, but we had a good living. Money turns out to be the common idol for those who are very wealthy. That's why in, in verses 24 and 25, Jesus makes the statement somewhat funnily that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. But notice something interesting here. Scripture says that Jesus looked at him with sadness. I found that really interesting. 
The point is that Christ longs for us to see, truly see, that the things that we attach our hopes and our dreams to, like money and possessions, don't save. They suffocate. Don't save. They suffocate. The disciples watching and overhearing all of this Verse 26 are aghast. Those who heard it, it's recorded, said, then who can be saved? They're astonished. After all, doesn't this culture, as it did those millennia ago, teach that great riches are evidence of God's favor? Again, no, no, and no. But that is how we think in this upside-down culture. And it is suffocating. But the question they asked was the right one. Well, then, who can be saved? And it's critical that we hear this answer. Because the the answer to sell everything and give it to the poor and follow me, for most of us, is we would walk away sad. Listen to how Matthew phrases it. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, with you and I, it's impossible. He knows our hearts. It's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Jesus told the truth. It's impossible with man. Not one single person can or ever will be saved without the saving grace of God. Money can't buy it. Great power can't command it. Impressive works can't cause it. It is Christ and Christ alone. Soli Christos. Only Christ. How do we know this? Look at verse 27. What's impossible with men is possible with God. When the powerful grace of God came upon Peter, James, and John, they did in Luke 5.11 what Scripture records. They left everything, all their possessions. They left their livelihood, their fishing boats, and they followed Jesus. In verse 28, this same Peter says to Jesus, See, we left our homes and followed you. Little piece of merit, kind of still stuck in his heart. That's the way we're built. Look at me. I did good things. Jimmy Kimmel says, in a comedic way, he said, I always do good things as long as the cameras are rolling. It's true. Peter says, we left everything and followed you. What then will we have? What will we get from doing that? And Jesus answers the question plainly, straightforward, verses 29, 30. Truly I say to you, there's no one who's left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come. You get a 200% return. You will get many things more in this time and for eternity. And there's the answer to any doubt we might have. Is Jesus worth following if it were to even cost us this? And he gives us a guarantee. Better than your bank. Better than the market. It's an absolute promise. He's never going to invest in bonds that won't pay. You will never lose by giving up for God what you cannot keep in order to gain what you cannot lose. Jim Elliott knew that. And he gave his life for that. And now you know. But notice something else about verse 29 to 30. It turns out, as I said, that this is a double promise. But not in the way the false teachers, the Prosperity preachers mislead millions. And J.C. Ryle, again, comments on the meaning of this many times more statement. 
He says, the believer shall find in Christ a full equivalent for anything that he's obliged to give up for Christ's sake. He shall find peace and hope and joy and comfort and rest in communion with the Father and the Son. His losses shall be more than counterbalanced by his gains. In short, the Lord Jesus Christ shall be more to him than property or relatives or friends. Brothers and sisters, and to all who can hear my voice who are near or who are far away from God, there is only one who loves you flawlessly, only one who gave his life for you, only one who dared to die for your sins, only one who will send his spirit to breathe life into our dead souls, only one who can give you peace, hope, and comfort, and only one who has the keys to the kingdom of heaven and can bring you in. Worshiping money will only take and destroy. Christ can give you true treasure that will never be destroyed. Now, the surprise ending that I promised you. Lean in. <laughs> This is not me coming up with a new interpretation. This is what scholarly Reformed theologians have mined from this. In Reformed theology, we understand a concept called typology. Typology simply means that God in Scripture uses other persons or events that prefigure or serve as a type of a future person or event to come. The anti-type is that person or event that fully expresses the truth of what came before. For example, Moses is a type of Christ who leads Israel out of literal slavery. But the anti-type, Christ, is the only one who actually and fully and completely leads, leads his people out of eternal slavery, that is, sin. You get the idea now, type and anti-type. So in our passage today, the rich young ruler is a type. And as a type, he could not meet or fulfill the request made. He could not put Christ first by demonstrating that money wasn't his God, by selling everything and giving it to the poor. But the anti-type is Jesus the Christ, the true rich ruler, who while possessing everything, who held in his hands the greatest power and was above all other rulers, gave up everything. In essence, selling everything and giving it to us, the poor in spirit, and who himself became poor in possessions and spirit, that you and I might be eternally rich. Amen? You see the point. Jesus is the rich young ruler who gave up everything for us so that we would become rich. He's the anti-type. 2 Corinthians 3.16 says this, But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and I'll add peace and hope. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. We're becoming like him from one degree to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The point is that we can't give up on our idols on our own, but where the Spirit of the Lord is, in our regenerated hearts, the veil is lifted, and we become transformed by degree into the image of Christ. That is, we see the truth that Jesus is God and that true riches, true security, true peace of mind, indeed, I would say truth itself, are found in him and him only. Let me wrap up now here. Jesus is the rich young ruler who not only could, but did, paving the only way for us to make him first because it is impossible with man. 
and thereby gaining eternal treasure in heaven. So you have the five applications that I came up with on your sheet there. Riches are a trap and a snare that will block our way to heaven if we trust in them more than Christ itself. Don't let it be the banana that keeps us in the cage. What is impossible, number two, with man is possible with Christ. We can't do what is required for our salvation on our own. Only Christ can, who veils us in his righteousness. Number three, the reason is that Christ is the rich ruler who gave it all up for our sake, making it possible for us to follow him and inherit the unfathomable riches now and throughout eternity, who literally bought our way into heaven for us. Number four, Luke 9.25 asks the question, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his very soul? The point is Matthew 6.24 makes is that no man can serve two masters. No one can serve both God and money. It is one or the other. And lastly, Matthew 6.19-21 gives us an explicit command and a warning. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves steal. But lay for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves can never break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be begs the question for each of us. Where is our treasure? Heaven or earth? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your patience with us. Thank you that you lead us to eternal riches that are truly secure. Like the disciples, Lord, we cry out, Increase our faith because in reality we're poor and pitiful on our own, grasping onto that which cannot save or even offer security. Thank you, Lord, that you became poor in order to bring us to heaven with you, with profound gratitude for our very lives, Lord. We thank you and love you. You stand with me, we'll sing one stanza, one stanza only. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Stand with me. As we sing. Brothers and sisters, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, 